These are the opinions of Nick Webb, Mike Carrazzo, and Elizabeth Efta. Uh, They're not the opinions of Ryerson. You know, we're doing our best to get you the best information that we have access to, but we recommend you do your own research. This is not investment advice. Uh, we may on occasion make forward-looking statements, but these are the opinions of, of the three of us. So let's go ahead and hop into it. So Elizabeth, welcome. Um, Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, I don't think the audience is quite ready for it yet. It's, it's pretty rare when you, uh, when you get a, a podcast or a webcast with not just one Buckeye, but two Ohio State Buckeyes right. on, the, uh, <laughs> on the webinar. So welcome. Um, I'm going to ho go ahead and kick it over to yourself to talk about the current freight dynamics. Great. Well, it's wonderful to be here. I know there's a lot going on in the freight market, which is why you guys wanted me to come on. Um, and really, I, I want to start with what are the five factors that are really influencing the market and, and what we have to pay for freight and what capacity looks like right now. So I think the easiest one to start with, all of these are interconnected, is probably equipment availability. So, uh, you know, most of us and most of our customers are in the manufacturing sector, and we all know how difficult getting equipment can be. So tractors and trailers are have very long lead times, just generally, just like any new car would. Um, currently, tractors and trailers have an even ex more extended lead time. If you think about that you want to go buy a new personal vehicle, we all know that there's chip shortages and other commodities that are, are causing us to have a shortage of personal vehicles. Same thing is happening on the commercial vehicle side. So when we go out and we need to replenish, whether that's our fleet or our carrier's fleets, they need new tractors, new trailers. And those lead times have been pushed out. We're looking at now, if I place an order today, it's about 18 months. Historically, that's been in about six months. Same thing with a personal vehicle. You're, you're looking at months. I think my mom just ordered a new car. It's four months out. So we're seeing those same delays in equipment availability, which then obviously impacts capacity in the market. Because if you don't have new equipment, it also is pushing used equipment up, just like used vehicles are going up. So that's going to cause some impact on your freight prices. Obviously, that's then also tied to inventory. So if people are having a hard time getting components in, whether that's in manufacturing or on the consumer goods side, we all know, and I think you guys have talked about it on Cup of Joe, all of the long lead times coming in from Asia and other imports. Well, we kind of pushed through that in the last two years. We've seen huge lead times, vessels sitting off of LA, people have kind of overcorrected and inventory levels are a lot higher because people didn't want to run out of inventory. That means that we're sitting on inventory now in the US, maybe not the inventory we want, but we're sitting on it. And so we don't need to be moving things around in the same way that we used to. Also inflation is impacting inventory. So we're all feeling that in our pockets as prices are going up, we're spending less on consumer goods, which means that those inventories that are sitting there are gonna continue to sit there because people aren't buying as much. So that's impacting what's gonna be used and what needs to be distributed throughout the domestic network. Same thing with fuel prices. Fuel is gonna start to continue to eat into people's spending and that's gonna impact the discretionary spending on those consumer goods, those inventories, and not wanting to spend money because you're putting expensive fuel into that vehicle that you've waited six to 18 months to get. So fuel prices are gonna push things up. I think this week we were at $5.15 for diesel here in the Chicago market, which is 62% higher than where we were sitting last year at this time. So that's having a huge impact on the market. Additionally, driver shortages. I mean, I think we've been talking about this. I've been in logistics for 20 years. Driver shortages have been something that we've been talking about for the last two decades. And this is gonna continue. You know, there was a recent article this week about not talking about drivers in the same way we do about as a commodity. We've got to think about how are we getting people in those seats, just like how are we getting people to work in our manufacturing sites, right? And Nick, you and I earlier today were talking about that Walmart just announced they're going to pay 
$100,000 a, a year to new drivers. These are drivers with no experience. So if we think about all the drivers we have on the road, that's kind of the entry point now to get people into wanting to drive a truck. It's not cool, it's not techy, you're not in an office. You, you've really got to put the hours in and we've got to continue to pay people to get those drivers in the seats behind our trucks and getting metal out the door to our customers and across the entire domestic network. Hey, Elizabeth, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but during the COVID uh, around 2020, wasn't one of the contributing factors to the driver shortage that um, folks just weren't able to get um, certified um, and, and on the road? I mean, is that still an issue? There's a backlog there or is it mostly the employment picture? So we are hopefully kind of coming out of that, but you're right, Mike, during COVID, if you think about it, how do we learn how to drive or how do we even learn how to drive a truck for that matter? You've got to be in the cab with another person. And due to COVID restrictions in a lot of states, driving schools were closed and unable to train drivers. In other states, the entire CDL process was shut down because the state government didn't have in-person driving tests. So not only were we not training drivers, there was no way for us to license drivers. Um, we're starting to come out of that and we're also starting to see a lot of trucking and larger trucking programs and technical colleges start to have training programs and schools for drivers because this is a known shortage and the pay is is going into six figures in, in a lot of markets. So it's something that if people want to get into it, we've got to train them and have the ability to get them on the road and licensed. Elizabeth, you and I were also talking a little bit this morning about um, just sort of the impact that the Amazon effect is having on the the, the freight market in total or, or the driver market in total. Could you speak a little bit to that just for the audience as well? Yeah, of course. So this is kind of also tied to inventories and making sure that those consumer goods are in the right place. Um, large consumer goods companies like Amazon, Target, other people that have huge distribution networks are willing to pay just to have captive capacity. So if you think about all of the different types of Amazon warehouses that there are, and then the movement of goods that needs to happen between all of those in order for that package to end up on your door. You know, if you order it this morning, you can probably get it tonight in Chicago and other markets the next day or two days out, right? But you've got to have a lot of drivers to do that. And they're willing to pay what they can to make sure that there's a driver sitting there in order for that to move when they need it. That means maybe they've got 100 drivers lined up to work on a Monday. They may only need 80, but they're going to pay a minimum for those extra 20 just to be available in case they need those 20 drivers to get, get that freight out the door and service their customers to the expectation that we all have that if I order it from Amazon, I'm gonna get it today or tomorrow. Got it, so it's, it's, it's basically just making the, uh, the competitive landscape for the manufacturing side of things that much more difficult, right? Right, I mean, we're on the manufacturing side, it, it's the B2B side, we're all competing for the same drivers. And there's actually a lot of drivers that are also moving from a commercial CDL environment over to those smaller trucks, delivering packages, making those door deliveries, because it's not as labor intensive. Yes, they're getting in and out of the vehicle, but they're not on the road overnight for you know eight to 10 days at a time. They're home every night out making deliveries and then back, so. Got it. So, you know, all of those impacts, they, there are some pluses and some minuses. And I think what we're starting to see is that inflation, these inventories, and the fuel prices are really starting to have an impact on where the freight market is going. So we saw huge dips in 2020 during the start of COVID, where all but essential businesses were closed. We weren't out. Um, had the same manufacturing and, and demands that we have now. Grocery had huge demands, other consumers had huge demands, but, but not 
the same that what we saw in 2019, for instance. So we look at a couple of things in the freight market to kind of judge that. Um, there's a few indexes we use, one being CAS index, which is one of the largest freight audit companies in the globe. They do millions of freight audit bills every um, month for their customers. So they can look and see how many shipments are there and what are people paying. And then we also have DAT.com, which is a little anachronistic because it's dialatrucker.com. But that's where the, all of this information is coming from. And this is not behind a paywall. So anyone on this call can go to DAT.com, go to the trend lines and see what I'm showing here. And it gets updated every single week. And then on a monthly, month over month basis. So this shows us two things. Where are the spot rates and what is the load to truck ratio? And the load to truck ratio is really what is the capacity versus demand in the market. So this one is really the most important to understand where should prices be going, right? So if there's more loads than trucks, prices should, and the spot rates should be going up. As that ratio gets smaller and loads per truck go down, we should also start to see some weakening in the spot market. So we've really started to see on the van side and also on the reefer side, which I didn't include in this slide, that that load to truck ratio is really starting to come down both year over year and then also month over month. We have not started to see that as much in the flatbed side. And there's a couple reasons for that. One is we are in proto season. And as we need to start getting goods from Texas, Southern California, out to the rest of the US, a lot of that moves on flatbeds. And then we're it starting to enter into build and construction season. For those of us in places like Chicago, where it was hailing earlier today, um, as the weather starts to get better, we've got to start to move buildings goods. Those also traditionally move on flatbeds. So what we're expecting is that the flatbed market will start to follow the softening that the van and the reefer market have already seen later in Q2 and into the second half of Q, Q of the year, excuse me, of 2022. So hopefully things will start to soften up. But if we think about freight is very cyclical and we are still higher than where we were in 2018, which is the last time that we had a tight market, even on the van side. So things are still relatively high to what we're kind of used to in the last five years or so. But compared to the last 12 months, we're starting to see some easing. Great information. Hey, Elizabeth, got, got one question for you. Um, speaking of congestion and tightness in markets, you know, we, we've spent a couple of cup of Joe's talking about port congestion and things like that for the international freight markets. And the one that always gets all the headlines is, is the, uh, the, the port outside of Los Angeles. Um, could you speak a little bit about how that dynamic is maybe maybe shifting to, to different ports or, or how, how you're seeing that evolve? Yeah, so things are starting to clear out the congestion in LA, which was also having an impact on the van market because we, we had to move all those containers from LA to wherever we needed to consume them in the US. One of the things though, just like we were talking about inventory and overcorrecting and bringing things in, uh, people started to move their supply chains from coming in on the West Coast, LA, Long Beach, and move that over to the East Coast. So as we switched those supply chains over to say Savannah and Charleston, the port of Charleston is really getting overwhelmed right now. Those ports are much smaller. They have a lot smaller workforces. And here in the US, we still unload most container ships using a longshoreman and a crane. We're, we're not as automated as ports in Asia and in Europe. So that congestion, it's easing in the West, but it's starting to really grow and ramp up in the East. So again, overcorrection, which we do all the time in every market, right? Same thing is happening here. And we're starting to see vessels line up and really see longer and longer wait times to get unloaded, especially in Charleston. Great, thanks for that. Mike, do you have anything else before we hop into the macro side of things? Yeah, there's one question that came in from the audience, Elizabeth, um, in reference to the um, van numbers you have here. Is that, mm -hmm. um, you, you talked a little bit about the flatbed, but looking at the van load to truck ratios, is this um, typical or is there something else impacting this that, that we have, no. don't, don't see typically? 
Yeah, so the flatbed, it, it's always seasonal that in Q2, we kind of, we see things tighten up. I would say in the van market, we see tightening in Q4, easing in Q1, but to see this much easing at the end of Q1, be early in Q2, is really more indicative of those things we talked about earlier. Inflation, inventories, consumer spending down, not needing to move as many goods around the U.S., so demand is going down. So this is less seasonality and more speaking to the other macroeconomic influences. Okay. What That's a great. phenomenal segue into the macroeconomic. <laughs> <laughs> I did that on purpose. <laughs> the um, one, one other question that came in here, any predictions on easing due to reshoring supply chains? Yeah, I mean, I, I really am focused on domestically here now. I think there's going to be short term some congestion as we move freight out of the southeast because of what's going on in Charleston and Savannah. So the, those rates are going to continue to be high, just like we saw off the West Coast earlier, you know, second half of 21 and, and even the beginning of January rates were, were pretty high. But I think once we get through that correction, we should be back to lower freight rates closer to, I don't even know what normal is anymore because <laughs> what is it, but, but certainly not to the highs that we've been, we've been seeing over 2021. And I love the cup of Joe audience because they kind of get warmed up with some like questions and then they get, there's, there's one that, that I don't know how much insight you'd have into, but do you have any insights on the labor agreement with the union longshoremen in the West coast? I do not. Luckily, I've not been having to pay. I used to have to pay attention to that a lot more um, when I was bringing a lot of containers in from from Asia. But luckily, um, that's someone else's responsibility. So 